Good evening. Uh, I think we can uh, already start. I would like to welcome all of you, and I'm very happy that so many of you came to this topic tonight uh, on the topic, uh, the OEC in a time of war, can the cooperative security be re revitalized? I think it's a very important topic. It's a very difficult topic, especially these days, since uh, I think it is not a secret that uh, the OEC is in a very, very difficult position these days. It is uh, blocked. Um, there is no budget yet. There is not really a chair for next year. Yet. There are additional challenges uh, in related to the war, and I think we are going to talk about this um, afterwards. Uh and uh, I just wanted to let you know about today, this is an IIP talk, which means that we will try to have more like a discussion. So it shouldn't be like long statements from all of us, but I have many questions prepared, but I would also like to bring you in and also to ask our experts. And I think we do have two very valuable experts uh, tonight, and I'm going to introduce them uh, now. Uh, I would like to welcome Terence Hopman. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the uh, Foreign Policy Institute at the John Hopkins University. As far as I know now, at the Fulbright um, fellow here in, in Austria, in Vienna, for the next uh, couple of months still. So welcome that you made it from the US to Vienna. And um, our other guest is uh, Fred Tanner. He is, uh, used to be ambassador, and he's also a former senior advisor to the secretary general of the OSCE. Uh, Swiss uh, diplomat, but also, I'm I'm, I might proudly say, also a member of the advisory board of the IIP. So I'm very happy that you made it uh, tonight as well. Um, I think we do have two very good experts. We do have one uh, more like dealing with the OSC in the last 40 years, also from a theoretical point of view, but also from a scientific point of view. And we do also have like the practical insights with Fred. And I think yeah, we are going to have a fruitful and interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to kick off uh, the discussion already with you, Terry, and I would like to ask you maybe if you can tell us a little bit about your experience, like very brief in the last uh, 40 something years. Yeah, 50 years. I mean, we're going yeah. to have a celebration at one point in 25 about uh, Helsinki, but it's a long time. I mean, what can you tell us uh, from your experience uh, 50 years ago compared to now? Would you say that something like the spirit, which was there then from, as Heinz always called it, uh, from um, Vancouver to Vladivostok, to, like to get to this uh, security community, what is left of it? Is there still something there? Well, thank you. Um, you know, my experience with, with uh, CSC, OSC, goes back to uh, 1974 when I was in Geneva at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And uh, I happened to interview the negotiators of the Helsinki Final Act during the Geneva phase uh, in, in the middle of the negotiations, of course, before the Final Act was completed. But nonetheless, it's when I first became engaged with, uh, with, with the process. And... Uh, as a result, I have followed it fairly closely since then and have come back to Vienna um, and uh, other locations um, to try to follow the OSE to the greatest extent that I can. So really, all, my, my experience with it goes back quite literally um, almost 50 years now, the same length as the uh, institution itself has existed. I think there, there are really a couple of important points to make about the early period of the CSE, um, which I think is very different from the spirit that I see now. Um, I mean, this was in the middle of the Cold War, but it was still a period of detente, uh, to some extent at least. And uh, there was a continuous dialogue uh, going on uh, all of the time, often in you know private sessions and so forth and so on. Uh, but the openness and the, and, and the sort of breadth of the discussions that took place in Geneva um, and um, in, the, in the early years afterwards, in the review conferences that took place in, in Madrid and later in Vienna, of course, before it became formalized uh, in 1990, um, all exhibited a kind of classic spirit of negotiation and dialogue and openness. It was easy for me to interview uh, Soviet delegates then. Um, you know, we could discuss and debate issues, uh, but we could also exchange ideas and so forth. Uh, there was a kind of openness that I, don't, that I don't see now. The other second factor that I really want to mention here is that um, CSC in its early years also was closely connected to the arms control agenda. Uh, the initial plan, in fact, was to have one big negotiation on European security. Uh, and in the early 1970s, those were broken down into the CSCE and the negotiations on mutual balance force reductions. 
uh, which led to the CFE Treaty, uh, which I also followed, which brought me to Vienna regularly also during the period of the, uh, of the negotiations uh, on, on MBFR and CFE. Um, and so therefore, CSE in one sense was the normative and political side of European security, while MBFR and CFE were the hard security side. But the two were linked. The same people were often going back and forth between the two negotiations. Um, and there were trade-offs that were being made in part. You know, when you go back and look at the final act, people ask, how could Brezhnev have signed uh, some of these principles that are in the Decalogue, uh, respect for human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the Soviets at that time were also very much concerned about the security situation, and arms control was important to them. And to some degree, I think they saw participation in CSCE also as a lever and as a venue through which they could also talk about hard arms control. So another problem that we face today, not only is that OSE is in trouble, uh, but that arms control has largely died, and therefore those linkages that we built on uh, in those early years uh, has, to a large degree, been broken. Thank you. Fred, what you heard, I mean, um, Terry was telling about at that time there was like the spirit a little bit more on, on dialogue. And now we know, and I remember, I think uh, two months ago, we did have a discussion here about security as well with uh, Lamberto Zanier, the former um, Secretary General. And he said, um, there is no dialogue going on these days now between within the OSC. He says it's just impossible. It's uh, literally more, it's about more propaganda. It's about ex uh, accusations between different parties. So the spirit of dialogue seems to be super difficult these days. Like, how do you assess the situation? Like, also coming from within, and I also know that you have been active, like, even after 2014, when the whole crisis literally started. It's not the, the war a year ago. So what would be your assessment? Yeah, first, uh, just one reply to uh, Terry. Um, which really struck me, and I think he's absolutely right, that um, we are today worse off than during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Cold War, I think there was a Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a very close to Armageddon, but uh, still, uh, I think there has been a lot of courageous diplomats who agreed to work together to, uh, across the Iron Curtain and having you know, agreement on normative commitments. And I think today it's not possible right now. Uh, we have seen a weaponization of the norms uh, just before the Russian's invasion of, of Ukraine, where uh, Russia tabled uh, in an ultimate way, uh, required OEC states to take position with regard to principles such as indivisibility of security versus uh, this freedom to um, choose your own alliance. You had a, you had a kind of uh, tension there. And Russia wanted to clarify that because it made clear link to NATO enlargement. So I think the norms also today are uh, contested. Uh, and that's, of course, a very serious situation uh, because I would argue that even so, the Helsinki Final Act has been violated thoroughly. It's still there. I mean, it's like in a traffic light. I mean, if, if a car drives through red, the traffic lights has still its validity and should be respected. But to come back to your question about the dialogue, um, I think it's a bit photo mieux that today there is still the structured dialogue, which is in hibernation. But if I understand correctly, and I look here, of course, to uh, some Austrian uh, colleagues who are very much involved in that, uh, it's, I think, uh, the idea really informally among small groups to to fell a sondage, to check really what is the common ground, where can we still move on, that's happening. And I think it's not the kind of pan-European dialogue, the big platform, it's more small and it's informal, uh, which does not need any kind of consensus. Uh, and so I think that's right now a bit the way that the situation is. I think there probably is dialogue in the Hofburg, informal, uh, I hope so, uh, also between Russia and uh, other states. Which, because uh, I think uh, without any dialogue, this organization will not uh, survive. Terry, after what you heard, but maybe you also mentioned before the Cold War. So my question would be like, why was it possible 
at times in the Cold War, you mentioned the disarmament because there was also an interest of the Soviet times then, you know, to come to an agreement. So what, why was it possible during the Cold War? What is not possible right now? How would you assess this situation? Well, I think there were leaders on all sides who recognized Can you that put there were common interests. A little interests. bit closer? Yeah, yeah. There, were, there were leaders on all sides who recognized that there were common interests, even in the midst of the competing interests that we had during the Cold War. Um, and those were clearly um, clarified even during the missile crisis. Uh, I had the experience in, 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 in 2002 of going to Havana with a, a number of major, well, Robert McNamara and a whole bunch of American policymakers, uh, Fidel Castro and uh, a large number of uh, former Soviet military and, uh, and, and, and diplomats. And, and even talking about how the people during the missile crisis recognized uh, the threats, the common threats that we had and the necessity of getting out of that crisis. Um, and uh, Khrushchev afterwards, I mean, remarked on how important it was uh, that uh, the threat of the use of nuclear weapons was just impossible. Uh, he, he actually told that general secretary of the Czech Communist Party the day after the crisis ended that Castro was a madman who was prepared to blow the world up and we had to work with the Americans to save the world from, from that kind of thing. So I think from that point on, um, there was at least an understanding that um, at, the, at the highest levels at least, that there was a necessity of trying to find the common interests even in the midst of the competing interests. And today, unfortunately, I mean, it was true to some degree also, frankly, with the Trump administration in Washington, um, uh, but it's certainly true on the, on the Russian side, I think, as well, that uh, the, the world has become much more simple. Uh, the, the, the ability to differentiate between shared interests and competing interests has disappeared. Uh, people have a much more black and white view of the world even than uh, was the case during the Cold War. And um, those experiences during the Cold War, again, if anything, inspired us to try to find ways to get out of that system uh, because everyone knew that the ultimate consequence of pursuing a Cold War in those days was probably the end of human civilization. Uh, and, and that was a pretty powerful common incentive. Uh, and for some reason, we've lost that today. Maybe just because we've survived so long, people think it just can't happen. But nonetheless, uh, I think it is important to keep in mind that that... Uh, it, it is still necessary to, to be concerned about these ultimate threats um, and, and to look for common interests even when we have competing interests. Fred, what, what would you say, to what extent, because we're sitting here and talking about an existential crisis of the OSCE and, and one of the main reasons is of course the, the, the war Russia is raging against Ukraine which is uh, also a member of the OSCE, so it is the only fora actually we are still having where Ukraine and uh, Russia are at least formally in. So what would you say, uh, what, is, it, is it only Russia that the OSCE is at the stage it is right now, or how would you assess the situation? Well, I think it's a good question. I think uh, there has been, of, been a serious crisis before that war within the OECE already. And I think it was not necessarily Russia and Ukraine. There were other states which kidnapped the agenda and uh, used this de facto uh, veto, right? Everybody, every participating state has as um, uh, to, to deny uh, consensus, uh, particularly in the Southern Caucasus. This was a, a preferred hobby, but not only. You had other Western states too, which insisted on, on, on uh, using that de facto veto if scales, contributions are not adjusted, etc. So there has been a lot of crisis, particularly financial crisis too. And um, I think at a certain stage, there has been also more and more a kind of political crisis that, uh, of course, ever since 2014 already, um, some, some kind of front states which developed a very radical view with regard to, uh, to Russia and the other way around, of course, too. And you had still a, a community which tried to hope that the OEC can absorb these tensions and eventually find some cooperative arrangements. And of course, that has been destroyed then with the invasion in February 2022. But uh, at the same time, I think that um, there has, of course, been a lot of efforts uh, to, to work with regard to the field missions. There has been uh, progress there, too. Uh, I think I'll uh, just refer here to SMM, the Special Monitor Mission, 
which was a highlight of the organization. I mean, there, I'm, I'm, I don't want to like praise the Swiss chairmanship here at that stage, but in 2014, uh, actually there was a turnaround uh, to, towards a more positive engagement, the crisis response, which set up an architecture of crisis response in Ukraine by the OECE, not just the mission, there are two missions, actually three missions even, and there has been uh, the, the trial at the contact group, etc. So a lot of uh, engagements by your organization, and that actually, and then of course, why did it not work? Why did Minsk, was Minsk not implemented? That's a completely separate question, which I think would take much more time to engage here, but perhaps we can come back to that. Yeah. Can I just follow up Please. briefly on that? I mean, I think clearly one problem, obviously, that has been particularly important, particularly with respect to Russia, is, is the extensive violation of the entire key. Not only, of course, the Helsinki Final Act, uh, but the Charter of Paris, again, which gave states the right to choose their own security arrangements. And uh, I'd particularly mention also the uh, Budapest Memorandum, which was signed at the 1994 uh, Budapest uh, uh, session of the, uh, of the OSCE, uh, so in, under OSE auspices, um, in which um, all four states, that is Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus, agreed not to even threaten to use force against one another, that they recognized the sovereignty of all four within their, quote, 1994 borders, unquote, uh, and uh, they even promised not to even use economic pressure against one another, um, as a consequence of Ukraine turning over, which they had no real choice but to do, uh, the nuclear warheads and delivery vehicles that were on their territory as well as on the territory of Belarus and Kazakhstan. Um, so, I mean, that was an important moment in the post-Cold War period where we had some cooperation, but also a clear recognition of the sovereignty of the post-Soviet states. Um, which was also reflected in the Charter of Paris uh, and in all of the acquis since then. So, I mean, to me, the, the, the critical issue that's caused so much loss of trust uh, in Russia uh, is the denial, the basic denial of the sovereignty of one of the participating states, which they recognized. They are saying now their leaders made a mistake. Well, I mean, when it comes to international law, uh, once you sign a binding agreement, then, you know, it... it it, it goes from one regime to another. One is stuck with what one's predecessors have agreed to. And you can't simply say, well, our predecessors made a mistake and therefore uh, we can throw out all of these agreements. But the result is, of course, that, I mean, the problem that the OSCE is going to face now is how do you trust Russia now that it's violated the entire key uh, of the OSCE over the last 50 years um, to conform to future agreements? Um, it'll be difficult to persuade a number of participating states, I think, in other words, to have trust as a result of, of, of what's happened uh, uh, in February of, of 2022, um, which in that sense was a real break point, I think, uh, for a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the participating states. Since you mentioned it, that Russia is not accepting Ukraine's sovereignty, and um, I, I think that's uh, very obvious to say, um, but it's still also a member of the OSC. I mean, how would you say that, um, does it make sense to, to have Russia within the OSC today? And because there is also this discussion about excluding Russia in one way, or at least like exclude them from voting rights. I think there was this one case at the Yugoslav war when we had the, the um, uh, when, when Yugoslavia was also more or less um, right. uh, deprived from, from the OSC in this sense. So, I mean, how do you assess the situation in this context? Um, should Russia still be part of the OSC? Well, we could both comment on that. I guess we both wrote about M it. Maybe it, Fred uh, starts. Uh, uh, maybe Fred ago. starts, and then you can follow First, first yeah. uh, technically, I think Yugoslavia was actually suspended. So it was not like, you know, Russia was, now was removed from yeah. uh, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. It was removed from the Council of Europe. Uh, and I think uh, now, of course, you have this consensus minus one procedure. <laughs> But we all know it's not going to work because uh, of Belarus. You have a Belarus, and also you you have a, perhaps a few other states, perhaps Central Asian states. Mm -hmm. And also, if you would succeed, I think it would not be, in my view, not in the interest of the OECE as an inclusive pan-European organization, because let's say if, if Russia would be removed or put at the door, 
then I think you have quite a few other states leaving as well. And I think then uh, you, you know, then the question is, what's your identity? Um, you know, perhaps your European Council Plus or something like that, then it doesn't make sense. So I think it's just uh, we all condemned to work with each other. Uh, and um, I think it's very hard for a lot of states, especially Ukraine, to be in the same room. But I think uh, somehow it's, it's, it's the DNA of that organization to try to find compromise and to work, move on. And there's no European security architecture if, if let's say, Russia is not somehow involved in it. I think the big dilemma is uh, the OSCE can't work now because of Russia, but without Russia, it loses much of its raison d'etre. I mean, the OSCE still is a major forum where other countries can try to talk with Russia, and at whatever point Russia decides that it's willing to come back in and talk, um, Russia is going to be part of European security, whether we like it or not, for many, many years into the future, probably for further into the future than any of us can foresee. Uh, and therefore, uh, for better or for worse, however difficult it may be, we're going to continue to have to deal with Russia. Now, and again, but without Russia, I mean, if they were, were eliminated, then with all due respect to the neutrals, <laughs> I know some of you from neutral countries around here, uh, you know, the OSE starts looking an awful lot more like NATO or the European Union or some combination of NATO and the European Union uh, in terms of its membership, except again for a few neutrals, and of course even Austria is in the European Union, uh, only Switzerland still maintains uh, that, uh, that, that pure neutrality. Uh, but, but I mean, my point is that it's, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, uh, to uh, really to, to justify its continued existence uh, if it is not a vehicle for trying to somehow bring Russia back into uh, some sort of international order. So I have the impression, so it seems that whatever the OSCE is going to turn out, but it depends a lot on what is going on on the battlefield right now. And I think this is part of the problem that we do not really know like where the war when the war will end, hopefully it will be soon, but we don't know. We don't know to what extent it will be end. We don't know who is going to win and what a victory means, what it would mean for Ukraine, what it would mean for, for Russia. So what can the OSCE do despite the situation? I mean, is there something or some way the OSCE can support Ukraine, even though the situation is as it is, as difficult with, the, with uh, Russia? Is there something the OSCE can do now? I think the OSC is doing already a few things uh, in terms of support uh, through these uh, extra, uh, extra budgetary projects. And um, I just would like to tell you a very short story of my experience when I was actually with the Secretary General uh, Lamberto Sanier in 2014 um, at the Munich Security Conference. It was February 2014. That means just a few days before President Yanukovych left, and you know, Yurama, the Maidan was in the highest kind of uh, violence and development. And, and uh, the Secretary General asked the Ukrainian foreign minister, then, what can we do? You know, let, we can help you. you know, we have instruments, we can send a fact finding mission, etc. And the foreign minister said, You know, Lamberto, I like it. He was actually the chair at the time. He said, Don't worry, we take care of it. There's no problem at all. And it's just two or three days before things really hit the fan. It just shows that the OEC can do things only when the host country agrees, if the conditions are right, I mean, to go into a certain area. And right now, I think uh, Russia, of course, would veto any kind of de uh, deployment uh, or engagement into, into Ukraine. So uh, the OEC has the instruments to do it. It's just the political will and the conditions which right now are not available. Just perhaps to say, one more point here. The OEC, of course, has options to use instruments which do not require consensus. And for me, I think I, I was really uh, interested to see how the Moscow mechanism has been used now a number of times. I think it has been used, I think, three times with regard to, um, with regard to Ukraine. I mean, atrocities in Ukraine. Uh, and also once or twice now also with regard to Russia in terms of human, human rights abuse and before elections, presidential elections in Belarus. So I think that that's, in my view, was quite remarkable because 
it really then feeds into other efforts of NGOs, of international community working on, uh, on collecting uh, data on a war crime and uh, crime against humanity. And so I think the OEC can make it share there and, and it's possible. I think it's also important to keep in mind and, and to continue the OSC for many of the other activities it's engaged in that do not get as much attention clearly as some of these high strategic issues, although some of them even relate to those. Again, Fred has already mentioned the role played by the missions. Um, one of the most important in my view is the mission in Moldova right now. Again, as partly as a side effect of the war in Ukraine, the status of Transnistria, the breakaway region in uh, eastern uh, Moldova, uh, has become even more of a crisis. It's been a crisis now in some sense for, for 30 years, but uh, again, that crisis is potentially heating up, and the OSCE is the only international institution that is effectively engaged in trying to manage that situation. Uh, and that's one very important example. Um, I am hopeful at some point that the uh, OSCE can get back engaged again in the conflict uh, around Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, the OSCE is still playing an important role on human dimension activities, primarily in Central Asia um, and in several other parts of the uh, former Soviet uh, space, um, dealing with issues like human trafficking and a number of other issues like that, that uh, uh, it, you know, movement of terrorists, uh, gender mainstreaming uh, in, in many of these countries and other kinds of things like that uh, to try to create more integrated and more democratic societies. Now, again, these things don't get a lot of publicity and, and movement in these areas is often very slow and not very evident. But nonetheless, it, 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 you know, it would be unfortunate because of the war in Ukraine to abandon all of these other activities uh, that are still a key part of uh, the OSCE uh, activities that, again, do not get the attention that the big strategic issues do, uh, but that over the long haul may be more valuable in terms of promoting long-term European security than uh, some of the more highly publicized activities. Yeah, just like to follow up here, Terry, I think that's a very good point. Also, the entire question about Pax Sovietica, I mean, entire kind of uh, post-Soviet region it had that was a huge impact by the war. I mean, Russia was absorbed by the war in Ukraine, and you have seen over in Kazakhstan there has been a kind of up upheaval. The, um, we have seen it in the Southern Caucasus with regard to Armenia, Azerbaijan, where Russia cannot necessarily guarantee any of the safety of Armenia, or doesn't want to, or has perhaps it's more difficult. Um, we see border clashes between, Turk, uh, between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. I mean, there's a lot of areas there uh, where actually the OEC, it's in the OEC space uh, where things should be done right now. And it's not the European Union which, which will do it. So I think the OEC could do it. I mean, I'm talking about Central Asia here. Or also with regard to Moldova. I mean, mm -hmm. we have the 5 plus 2 which are blocked. But there is this 1 plus 1, this so-called Berlin plus uh, negotiation still ongoing which actually the, the, the OEC mission plays an important role, has a mandate actually to help in this. So I think there are certain differences which can be made. And I agree with you, we should not just be blinded completely by the war. There are other areas around it which have similar problems, which perhaps OEC can do more efficiently, provided they're resourced. They need to be resourced, of course, empowered to do that. Okay, so the OSCE still does play a role. I mean, there are still missions, OSCE missions ongoing. But nevertheless, uh, I would like to come back to a topic you raised before, which is the topic of trust, of course. And it is a, it is a topic which is very difficult to restore trust once it is lost. So, but there is also the, the mechanisms you always see, always had the confidence and security building mechanisms. I mean, maybe you can also explain us a little bit uh, what does that mean, like in, 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 in effectively? I mean, how do they look? Because it always seems to be such a nice word, you know, to have like, oh, we just invest in confidence building measures and then we will come up like with a good solution and everyone is going to be fine with it and we go back to be, um, business as usual. But this confidence building measures uh, seem not to be working 
working these days. So what would be your assessment in, in how to rebuild this trust? And maybe also additionally to, uh, additionally to that, is it really trust which is so important or would we need like more like functioning institutions which also work even though you do not trust this country at one point because we never know what is happening. You said if you inherit like specific things from the previous government that it is always a challenge, especially in countries which are not as democratic um, as um, some Central European or Northern European countries are. <laughs> okay. I mean, there, that's a, it's a very difficult and broad question. Um, on, on the question of trust, again, I mean, Russia is clearly a problem, uh, but uh, Vladimir Putin is not going to last forever. Um, you know, like all of us, he's mortal. Uh, we don't know what, and, and the end of the war may have some impact. If Russia loses badly, the regime will, will undoubtedly face internal criticism. Now, that could lead, it's important to point out, in different directions. It, it could lead uh, to a more liberal regime, like the arisal of Gorbachev in the, in the late Soviet period, or on the other hand, uh, some of the real extreme fascists uh, who are uh, on on. Putin's right right now could merge into power and we could face an even more dangerous and, and, and worrisome Russia than, than we face right now for the entire, entire global system. But the, the point is anyway, I think, to kind of keep things alive uh, until we know what happens uh, and, and, and hoping that again, as happened in the Cold War, and, and this was again the critical role, particularly played by the Vienna Review Conference in the, in, 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 in the late... Uh, uh, 1980s, from 1986 to 1989, of the CSCE uh, and of the Helsinki Final Act, um, where lots of important things happened that uh, became possible because of Gorbachev, but that also supported Gorbachev's reforms. One of the most important was uh, the right of citizens to go from one country to another. And a lot of people in East Germany discovered that they could go visit their relatives in Hungary. And once they got to Hungary, they discovered that the Austrian border wasn't all that closed. And they could, in many cases, come to Vienna and go off and then join their relatives in West Germany before the wall came down. Um, the, the system was already leaking, in part as a result of some things that happened in the Vienna Review Conference of the CSCE uh, here in this town. That, that actually in some ways undermined some of the most authoritarian and repressive aspects of the Soviet regime and in that sense also reinforced the reforms that Gorbachev was trying to make as well. Now, will that happen again? I don't know. But I think it is important to have an institution available that can uh, kind of encourage that process uh, if it becomes possible. If it doesn't, then uh, we may be in for a very long and hard haul before we see the end of this, uh, of this tunnel. Yeah, perhaps just a word about uh, trust and confidence building. I think it's, of course, impo uh, impossible now. You have this, as you say, black and white. You have a binary situation uh, which uh, between NATO states and Russia and uh, war prevents here any kind of confidence building. I think that we have, of course, the Forum for Security Cooperation Actually, I think Austria had it a few months ago, and now it's Bulgaria, I guess. And there's some work being done there, uh, with which I, I actually thought was not bad. Uh, that you you make the link to climate change. You know, the, what armed forces pollute. No, and there's certain responsibility uh, to have some kind of uh, agenda point there, or uh, also uh, security comp private security companies. So you can, you can bring up topics there which may not be completely linked to the Vienna document, but of course it's also just to gaining winning time in some respect, because I think the Vienna document has been, has been triggered a certain, I think the article, uh, there's chapter three, I guess, about you know, unusual military activities with regard to Russia and uh, invading another country. And, and that of course did not work. I think Russia did not show, did not show up anymore as it was the case in 2014 too. So I think this mechanism, it's just, it's just not, a, a, it's not a bad weather mechanism, it's a good weather mechanism. So there's no space for confidence building at large right now. Maybe one more question then uh, on Ukraine, since we said how difficult it is uh, 
these days to come that the OSCE is active at all. But maybe there will be a, a time, and I said it earlier, I hope it will be soon uh, when the war is over in whatever shape it is. What could the OSCE do in a post-conflict uh, Ukraine? Like, I mean, what maybe to you, Fred, what do you think? What could the OSCE bring in? And what is the comparative advantage the OSCE has? Maybe in comparison also to the other security organizations um, uh, which are... Um, available, be it like part of the European Union, be it um, the CSTO in the East or, or um, even NATO in a sense. So, I mean, what is the comparative uh, advantage of the OSCE in this sense when it comes to Ukraine? Well, I'm a bit biased here because I, I was in the lead of a study on the SMM, the Special Monitoring Mission, right. which was a ceasefire monitoring mission, which, by the, by the way, which was not negotiated. The Minsk agreement, which handed down the ceasefire mandate, was not negotiated by the OSCE, but by um, by the Normandy uh, and try the contact group. Uh, then uh, that's just the point that it means that uh, even now if there could be some kind of um, uh, peace arrangement or ceasefire, again, I think we should really dis differentiate now between ceasefire and peace agreement. Minsk did not do that, and I think that was one of the reasons it was not implemented. It did both, tried to do both, ceasefire arrangements, and also it had uh, language and commitments on, on political, commit, political uh, you know, special status and, and things like that. So I think, I think the point is really that even though the OEC right now is politically not really present in, in, in Ukraine, unlike other organizations, NATO is very present, the European Union is very present, um, you have the UN to a certain degree as well with the grain agreement, um, but there could be a mandate passed down to the OEC by, uh, could be by the UN or by other organizations, which may be perhaps again monitoring and see, monitoring and reporting OEC is very good in that. It's it's um, it is uh, again inclusive. It's not representing NATO or or the European Union. And I think that could be much more acceptable by by Russia. Not to forget that um, I just read the, the Russia has a new foreign policy uh, concept, and there actually it OEC is still there, which is quite I was quite surprised to see that that they they talk about. Uh, coexistence of European states and also your OEC can play a role in all this. So I think OEC has still a chance to be accepted by hopefully the West as well and of course by by Russia in, in a post-conflict situation. I think ceasefire monitoring is one, one area and all related to uh, military disengagements, you know, demining, uh, de de demobilization. Like SMM already did, like disengagement zones, uh, supervising disengagement zones, etc. And and who knows, this may be the case again. Same question. I think it's also possible that the OSC can play a role in some of the uh, humanitarian issues and political issues that will undoubtedly also follow when this war comes to an end. And in particular, I'm thinking of the role of two of the other major institutions within the uh, OSE context, namely ODIR, uh, the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, based in Warsaw, uh, and the High Commissioner on National Minorities, uh, uh, based in The Hague. Uh, the High Commissioner played a great role, for example, in Crimea, um, much earlier on, um, when after the Soviet Union broke up in the, the 1990s, um, trying to secure the rights particularly of uh, ethnic Ukrainians in Crimea and uh, the Crimean Tatars. Uh, however the war ends in the Donbas, uh, whether Lugansk and, and Donetsk are under the control of Russia or Ukraine, there's going to be minorities there. There will be either Russian minor, ethnic Russian minorities who identify as Russians in those regions uh, and or there will be people who identify as Ukrainian in Russian control regions. Uh, so the issues of minority rights and, and the protection of minorities, um, whatever the outcome of the war and whoever ends up controlling politically parts of Ukraine, uh, I, I hope, of course, it's Ukraine that's doing it personally, uh, but nonetheless, uh, 
a number of options are possible, uh, having someone to deal with the minority issues that will undoubtedly become very serious in the aftermath of this war is, is an important thing, but also Odier's role in trying to rebuild democracy. I mean, the only way these areas are ever going to be able to be stable over the long term is if they can figure out ways to create democratic institutions uh, and to accept majority rule, but also to accept the essential principles of give and take that are a central part of democracy. So working on democratization uh, in these regions and, and giving people there a sense that they have a voice in whatever political regime they're living under uh, will be critical. And again, th there's no institution that has more experience in this region in doing those kinds of things than, than ODIR um, and uh, other uh, related uh, OSCE institutions. So I, again, it's important to keep in mind that there are these other institutions here uh, that, that I think can play a very important role on the humanitarian uh, side of uh, post-conflict situation, um, and in particular, uh, dealing with uh, the issues of rights of women, minorities, uh, and other groups that may be subject to discrimination uh, yeah, not only Russians and Ukrainians, but the issue of the Tatars, for example, again, is an important one in that region. Uh, people who have been subject to discrimination, uh, uh, you know, whose ancestors were imported to, uh, many of whom died uh, uh, it, by Stalin in, in the last days of World War II, and, and were only allowed to return to Ukraine uh, under the Gorbachev period, um, but have been subject to discrimination, uh, well, the serious discrimination, again, throughout the region, uh, by both Ukrainian and Russian authorities. Uh, so um, these are a number of important issues anyway where the, the OSC has some experience, uh, where it's worked with um, say the Albanian community in, in, in now more North Macedonia um, to promote in greater integration of that community. Um, and again, uh, this discrimination against uh, various ethnic groups that are traditionally Muslim uh, has been a problem in the region, again, where the OSCE can also, I think, play a, a really significant role in a post-conflict situation if it's given access uh, and if the parties are willing to let it, uh, let it do what it can do well. You say the OSCE can uh, still uh, give important um, inputs, and my question would be, from your experience, uh, how do you assess also the member states of the OSCE? Do you have the feeling that they are still interested in the OSCE, and do you feel the support of the member states of the OSCE in general? And the same question would be for you on the on the US, because I think that's a very important topic as well, because I'd be very interested to see how the US actually perceived the OSCE, because we know that the um, USA is, is not so much, uh, I would say, eager to have uh, to deal so much with um, cooperative security, but mostly like with NATO. And talk, we talk a lot about coming back to these uh, hard security measures about armament and militarization. So this seems to be on the table right now. So, above, but how would you assess the situation of the member states? So, is there support for the OSCE? Is it enough? Is there enough <laughs> support, maybe? Yeah, I think it's um, certainly everybody is, of course, concerned about the situation. And um, I think um, we can always measure a bit the commitments by states through their presence. I think in Vienna, like in other UN uh, cities like uh, Geneva, New York, I mean, how many ambassadors does Switzerland have in Vienna? Or in, I think the United States still has three. We have two. Uh, actually, we have three as well. And, uh, and then if the number goes down and staff because you have less to do, that's a very clear indicator and it's worrying. It's a very worrying sign. I don't know how much, I don't have insight now uh, in terms of uh, the commitments and the presence uh, of, of uh, the various delegations. But I think they all, uh, of course, would like the OEC to succeed. But states, you know, multilateralism has been a retreat for years and to then uh, have a deal. Uh, I mean, you have also aggressive nationalism, not just, uh, let's say, in a country like Hungary or so, but also in the United States under the Trump administration, which actually also pulled out of commitments uh, uh, in open skies and, and INF, et cetera, which was disruptive. And that didn't help to the OSC either. I mean, but on the, it was still at the chapeau, of course, of open skies and, of course, the Vienna document 
And so I think in this sense, um, these disruptive developments and the, the lack, the, the, the retreat of multila multilateralism has very much been damaging. Uh, also the motivation of states in, in helping. And I think the key really is to have a few, how shall I say, heavy hitters. I mean, countries which can have some gravitas, they really have to create a group of friends now to pull things around. They have to put pressure on Estonia to make sure that Estonia is pulling back and giving space to Austria to take over 2024 chairmanship. That there must be pressure uh, on Russia somehow. Uh, I don't know how about the budget. About uh, I don't think Russia is systematically putting the veto down. I think there must be a certain understanding which can be worked out. But it needs to kind of dedicate a group which helps the chair, the chair uh, or even the Troika in, in this, and the capitals must get involved in all this. Mm, additional question on that, since you mentioned it, do you think that maybe the neutral states uh, within the OSC, do they have like, um, is it easier for them to come to terms, or do you think they have like a special interest in the OSC? Do, do you think it's easier for neutrals within the OSC, or do you think it doesn't make a difference if you're neutral or not? I think, you know, like a country like Switzerland has always had a very special uh, relationship with the OECE. I mean, it's not, not a NATO country, it's not a European Union country, actually, until, what is it, 20 years ago, it was not even in the United Nations. And so OEC was, or CSCE and the OEC was important. And I think that that's, that's still there. Uh, I think Switzerland has a, still a strategy for the OEC, how to engage in the next few years. I'm not sure how many countries still has an OEC strategy today. I haven't seen anyone... Uh, Germany always had one, also in the Bundestag. I haven't seen the most recent one, how much there's still a commitment on that. Um, and uh, you have, of course, uh, other neutral states which have their own problems now. I think also Switzerland, Austria, uh, about the neutrality is becoming difficult in this black and white uh, situation uh, with uh, expectations about you know delivery of uh, armament, munition, uh, all the way to questions of... Uh, you know, cooperating economically too uh, with funds uh, which are frozen, etc. So I think the neutral states have a very hard time right now, and I think um, OEC cannot give them answers to these questions. I think that the answers lie more in, in uh, I think, OECD or in the UN or EU uh, or bilaterally. The um, US on the OEC. I mean, I think it's safe to say for the public of the United States, the OSC is not well known at all. I mean, it, it, it really is, is it's not well known, even among some of my professional colleagues in the field of international politics. If I tell them I'm studying the OSCE, I occasionally get the question, oh, you mean the OECD? No, no, no. <laughs> That's a different organization. Um, you know, and it shows uh, sometimes, I think, often the... Uh, the, the, the lack of knowledge even uh, among many, many professional scholars of, of, of what the OSCE does. Um, and certainly the Trump administration had a very negative attitude towards it insofar as it knew what it was, um, or what anything was, but of course it had a negative attitude towards uh, all multilateral institutions, so therefore uh, the OSCE was not a particularly uh, victim that was, uh, that, that was somehow, um, you know, uh, focused on by, by the administration. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think it's important to know that, I mean, in, 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 in the Washington sort of uh, international circles, particularly in the State Department, the OSC has always been highly valued, I believe. Um, I mean, some of our best diplomats in the United States have come to Vienna and, and have, or are heading missions uh, um, in the, the various OSCE missions around the world. Um, and um, so, I mean, from the professional side, um, I think in, in the State Department, this institution is, is valued very highly, actually. Um, I mean, people who know it and have worked with it and have some understanding of what it does uh, recognize its significance. Um, the, the other point where there's some political role is that the Helsinki Commission in the U.S. Congress is also um, an important uh, facilitator within uh, the U.S. Congress on keeping people informed about the OSCE. Now, to some degree, the Helsinki Commission has probably emphasized the human rights side more than any of the others, and that's important, uh, but nonetheless, um, 
Sometimes uh, it, the, the commission, or at least some members of Congress, have used, uh, used it as a kind of a club to uh, attack uh, countries they don't like that, uh, for obvious reasons, are, are discriminating, uh, or you know, are not observing the OSE human rights principles. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, I think if the OSE can somehow come out of this current crisis with Ukraine and show that it's played a significant role somehow in, in bringing this war to an end and in, in promoting post-conflict uh, resolution of some kind, um, its stock in the United States could go up greatly and, and actually people in the media might start recognizing it. Um, and uh, if, if people on CNN and some of the other major networks start talking about the OSCE and what it's doing in Ukraine, um, which they didn't do, unfortunately, very much about the SMM, in spite of its significance and, and, and the role that all of us recognized it was playing, uh, but it just didn't make the major media. Uh, but the war in Ukraine, of course, has gotten so much media attention that, that if the OSE can play a significant role uh, in, in bringing this conflict to an end and promoting post-conflict uh, peace building of some form, uh, I think that could really actually shift public opinion uh, to become much more supportive of the OSCE as well as uh, in government circles and Congress than it has historically. Thank you. My last question before we go into the audience is, so your personal assessment, do you think cooperative security will survive? Will the OSCE survive this crisis? You said earlier, it's not only the crisis of the OSCE, it's a crisis of multilateral institutions in general. And so the OSCE part of it is also a victim of this whole crisis. So what is your personal assessment? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we each want the other one to go first on this one. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't know. Um, I mean, I think a lot depends on how this war ends. Um, you know, if the war continues or if the war comes to a bad end, and if Russia becomes increasingly isolated as a result of that, um, it's going to be very hard uh, restoring uh, the OSCE uh, and, and, and building on the functions that we've all talked about uh, here so far and have tried to stress uh, that will somehow get overlooked uh, if, if it looks like it's failed. Uh, to provide some avenue out of this, of this war. Uh, on the other hand, if it does, um, it, could be, it could be revitalized. That could become the basis for revitalization. The other thing I want to go back to what I said at the very beginning, the connection early on of CSCE to European arms control was really important. The Open Skies Treaty was negotiated uh, in the context of the OSCE. Um, and signed at an OSCE summit. Um, so there was a whole history of this relationship between conventional arms control, open skies, even although it didn't take place in the OSCE context, INF, which have all disappeared. Um, but if we could get back talking also about arms control and ways in which that can also contribute to the security of Russia and of other countries, um, in a post-war situation. Um, that may also provide the critical linkage, which was, in my view, really critical to starting this process in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, we, might, we might build on that linkage again, uh, but at this, time, at this point in time, um, arms control seems to be pretty much a dead letter on, uh, uh, on, on, on both the Washington uh, and uh, Moscow side. But, uh, we, we may eventually see the light again about the importance of arms control uh, for security in this region. Yeah, from our side, I think the OEC will survive if it manages to maintain its operations. I mean, operations are ongoing now. I think the field, the field missions, uh, and if that, if 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 you know people are leaving, uh, the positions are not covered anymore, or no replacement. Um, but if there's enough, if there are enough resources to keep operations going, I think the OEC will survive. I mean, there's hibernation in certain areas, which already now uh, makes uh, an impact. But uh, I think that uh, it's a bit an issue of leadership to uh, um, leadership uh, from from the, uh, the countries, the chair in office, Troika, and also from from the secretary general. I think it's very important that they are able to re-engage, uh, uh, the, the kind of motivate uh, the, everybody engaged. And I think the other one is uh, going back a bit more to Thierry about uh, the United States. I think um, 
I, I, I remember that uh, Secretary of State Blinken, he actually mentioned uh, just, at, just before the war, I mean, it was, was after the summit uh, between President uh, Putin and Biden in Geneva that actually there were three platforms identified and actually this was even when the US gave a reply to the Russian request just before the war, this kind of draft treaty. Um, Secretary of State Blinken mentioned, uh, of course, the bilateral, the strategic stability talk uh, discussions, SST, then the NATO Russia Council and the OECE. These are three platforms which he referred to as possible re-engagements. Uh, OECE is important, I think, also for the US to the extent that they know them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Because smaller states, states like Ukraine have a voice. The, Ukraine has no voice in NATO or Russian Council, at least not for now. And so I think for that purpose, I think the OEC will politically, as a platform, still play an important role. And will survive. Thank you so much for this um, very, very interesting insights. Um, we do time, uh, have time now for questions, and um, my colleague over there will give you the mic. I have one here and then later over there. Yeah, here to Heinz first. Please present yourself All briefly. Right. All right, um, <laughs> yeah, Heinz Gärtner, I'm with the Institute here as, uh, as well. Um, they are both old friends of mine, so um, I can't be nasty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you for the exciting uh, debate. Um, nevertheless, you painted a gloomy picture of the present uh, OSA, more, more or less. And uh, Fred said, we are worse off than in 73, 75, which is true. So the conclusion is we have a stalemate now of the OSA but it worked during the height of the Cold War to set up the CSE. C C so my question would be, would it be time to create something new like we did in 73, 75? Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have new challenges and new challenges have to be addressed. Then the Soviet Union was the main challenge. challenge. The U.S. was the balancer. Now we have China as a new uh, challenge. So somehow China should be involved. NATO is doing it already. The NATO strategic concept addresses China as the main challenge. Uh, so is it time, isn't it time to think about something new? Of course, there are all these small successes of the present uh, OSCE with the missions, the operations, and human rights. Uh, but does not save the OSCE. I just want to remind you that also the League of Nations was so successful in small conflicts, Kung Fu, Holland Island, Spitsberg, or whatever. And it failed after all anyway. So. Thank you. We can address that already, and then oh no, we, we collect one. There's one in, in the very back, was the second one? And then one over there, and then we take, take a second round. Yeah. So thank you very much. So my name is Jun Saito, a PhD student of the University of Vienna. And thank you very much for your uh, quite exciting uh, lectures, yeah, because it is quite precious time for me to uh, inform me of the uh, state of the art of the uh, OSCE. And my question is about uh, the OSCE in the European security architecture. Uh, you have just uh, mentioned the, uh, the US state, uh, Secretary of State, Blinken mentioned uh, three venues of the, the conduct between Russia and West, or Russia and NATO, and uh, which venue so with he or uh, NATO Russia Council of the NATO of the NATO and which venue prefers the Western participating states and especially uh, NATO member states? And the second question is uh, OSCE and EU. So the Javier Solana uh, once said the both institution is natural born partner and now the EU uh, speaks in the OSCE. So not are not the, uh, in one voice, so represent, represented by the, uh, uh, represented by the, uh, uh, the presidency of the Council of the European Union. And the question is, the 
EU and OSC is、uh, cooperative or competitive? Because、uh, you, men you mentioned the, the possible、uh, task of OSC in the Ukraine after、uh, the end of the war, namely nation building or promotion of democracy. But on the other,、uh, on the other hand, Uh, the Ukraine is a candidate of the、uh, EU membership, and that's why the possibly the, the mission of OSCE is、uh, subordinated to the、uh, accession process of the Ukraine、uh, to the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this debate. I'm a former Austrian representative to the OSCE,、uh, and your, your, your contributions reminded me of this famous quote of Mark Twain that reports of my deaths are、uh, seriously exaggerated. Can you put the mic closer? <laughs>、yeah, seriously exaggerated. And uh, I think uh, you, you mentioned uh, some of uh, the continuing activities, and in a way, the OSCE as much or as little paralyzed as the Security Council.、Mm -hmm. Uh, wherever there is no need for a specific consensus decision, this organization is active and has continued to be active in the, in the paralyzed world of diplomats in the Hofburg, but also in the field missions and, of course, in the work of the institutions. So, my question would be、uh, how can one、uh, actually capitalize, or how do you think one could capitalize on the fact that? Uh, even without a budget, even without、uh, clarity about next year's、uh, chair, et cetera, et cetera,、uh, the, the continuing work of this uh, organization uh, can be capitalized on, point one. And point two,、uh, could that also be helped by、uh, sort of in, in enhancing external Uh, input into this organization. It's very close to NGOs other than,、uh, than other international organizations. There is a parliamentary assembly uh, which uh, used to be on a, on a different planet, which is now、uh, <laughs> trying to make an effort to contribute actively to the current debate on how to revert. Can that not be encouraged? There is、uh, the Helsinki Commission you mentioned in, in, in,、uh, in Washington. There is not much、uh, similar. Parliamentary、uh, bodies in other participating states. So there would be, a, 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 I think, a potential for, for stronger engagement to enhance ownership for an organization which I think many would agree is irreplaceable, even if currently hibernating. Thank you. Thank you. We will do a second round、um, so, so that you can remember the questions. Who would like to start and to address、um, the questions? Okay.、Um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard now to say just what kind of institutional structure is, is likely to survive, that we will need something to deal with European security that is somehow also, though, has a special role that distinguishes it from the other institutions. That is, what is the difference between what the OSCE does and what the United Nations does and what NATO does and what the EU does、uh, and so forth and so on、um, is, is going to require some. Uh, some hard thought. Whether or not we need a new organization, or maybe just to rename it to, in order to somehow make it、uh, look like it's not the same old organization,、uh, old wine and new bottles, if you like, but nonetheless,、uh, exactly the, the, the good wine that, that is still there,、um, you know, is, is, I think, a kind of an open question、um, that, that we're going to have to deal with at some point.、Um, but、uh, I think. We all agree that、uh, there are a lot of very important functions that are going to have to be, have to be performed.、Um, and、uh, I've certainly I, I've, I've, I've written what, five or six chapters in, in, one of, in Heinz's books about、uh, the OSC e over the last 20 years,、um, as well as on several other topics,、um, but mostly OSC e、um, And so, I mean, I really think that this institution is important and the functions that it performs are important. To me, it's less important what we call the organization and what its formal structure is than that we have some institutional mechanisms for dealing with the kinds of issues that 
confront European security. The danger that I fear is that we're going to go back into something worse than the Cold War in some sense, that is, uh, back to the old realpolitik, back to the notion that uh, uh, security depends entirely on defense and deterrence, and therefore uh, it's entirely a military uh, relationship between uh, the Russians on one side and NATO on the other side. Um, and, and that, unfortunately, in my view, is a possible outcome of, of, of what's going on now. Uh, it's, it's an outcome that I think needs to be avoided uh, because I think it's a very dangerous outcome because it turns the world into an essentially bipolar uh, thing where everything becomes a binary choice. Uh, you're either for us or against us and, and there's nothing in between, which is a very dangerous situation in any kind of institutional structure. Um, and therefore, I, need, I think we really need to preserve the OSCE but the exact form in which that will take place, whether it's in a new name or whether there's some new functions added, uh, whether China is added or whether China is better dealt with through the UN context. Um, you know, I mean, at some point, if, if, if it becomes too global, it, it, it maybe loses some of its, its, its regional security focus in, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, although, obviously, it, we, I mean, we went as far uh, you know, as adding Mongolia, I actually testified to before the Helsinki Commission on, on the Mongolian uh, uh, decision to, to bring Mongolia uh, into, the, into the OSCE. Um, so it's, it's, it's gone pretty far in Asia, and of course it has its strategic partners in, in North Africa and Asia as well, uh, through which it can dialogue with uh, a number of other countries outside of the OSCE region. Um, uh, the, the world is always going to have multiple and overlapping institutional structures. Um, what I think will be important will be to try to find some way of, of designing um, a follow-on to the OSCE, hopefully without any major changes, uh, but, but preserving its major functions um, in spite of or however this war in, in Ukraine ends. Uh, but we do have to face the possibility and be prepared for the possibility that if the political outcome, if the military outcome particularly is bad, the politics may force us into a kind of notion where, again, it's us against them, where in some sense it's even a more bipolar world than we experienced in, in the Cold War, uh, when in spite of the bipolarity there were, there were, always, there were always channels of communications and linkages. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is a danger to be avoided. And we need to be open-minded about how we, how we avoid that, that danger. But I think that has to be our primary focus in thinking about the future of, of, of European and North Atlantic security. Well, now in a privileged situation, I can just fill in a few gaps uh, which you have uh, left, which are almost uh, none, actually. But I think uh, with regard to Heinz, uh, your question, I think the much deep institutionally much depends on, on the war outcome. I think the war outcome will may create new architecture or may not. Again, I mean, mm -hmm. if it's a Korean type of outcome, then there will be no more. There will be perhaps an armistice <laughs> commission and that's it, and there will be deterrence and there will be uh, some kind of binary relationship for a long time to go. We have seen in Korea now, I think since this is uh, over 50, 60, 70 years now, uh, ongoing, and I hope this would not be the case uh, with regard to Russia and, and, and the West, but it cannot be completely excluded. But I think there may be other type of outcomes which uh, where the United Nations hopefully could then come in a bit more forcefully, uh, and um, then uh, there could be some kind of uh, uh, role attached to the OACE in this kind of uh, uh, security arrangements uh, with security guarantees uh, given by NATO and perhaps other uh, states and, and the OEC can, can take up its functions, which, which it may have in this, in the perhaps normative too. I mean, again, I think we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we have still the Helsinki uh, final act, and I think that, that will not go away, and this cannot be replaced. Um, that was actually, uh, you know, this... Uh, Ishinger, uh, Ambassador Ishinger led panel of eminent persons on European security in 19, 20, 2015, 2016. And that report must, was made very clear that there's no substitute to Helsinki principles, even with Ukraine, even uh, with uh, contestation of, of certain principles. But uh, I think 
you cannot just replace certain principles with others, they are they're there, like the UN Charter uh, as well. But institutionally, I think just to perhaps put a few things together here, I think we should also look more at the Shanghai Cooperation Council, um, which uh, will, I suppose, gain more, more influence. Uh, China is there, Russia is there. Uh, I look at countries like Kazakhstan, which, you know, I think we talk about neutrality. I think there's a countries which drift away slowly from Russia and the Russian influence and they have a, they're more self-asserted. And there may be a few other countries like that. Uh, I don't think there will be a new N and N arrangement, but there may be some kind of non-NATO, uh, non-really pro-Russian uh, allies group which, which could emerge uh, as a consequence of the war again with the breakdown of Pax uh, Sovietica uh, as, as one of the, the results. Then I think the influence of the European Union will certainly be growing. I mean, the, all EU states are part of the OECE, of course, and, and I think the US already is, I think, the largest donor of one of the largest donors, uh, perhaps together with the US. And the EU uh, has elevated its cooperation now, uh, I think also thanks to the Secretary General, which was, of course, has, has been the Secretary General of, of the EU um, uh, Commission. Uh, that, of course, helped, helped a lot. We also see that the EU takes over a number of presents in the field from the OECE. I mean, this happened right in Georgia, where in 2008 the OECE had to leave. European EU monitor mission came in. It's happening now in a different fashion in Armenia, where uh, I think the co-chairs have no more présence. They are actually not present or uh, existent uh, at all in the region anymore. Uh, but the EU now has a fact-finding mission there. So I think, I think there are certain shifts already now uh, taking place. And then I think uh, with regard to the question of um, Ambassador Stroal, um, there are, of course, certain activities like human trafficking, where the OEC really has been doing a very good job now with, um, I don't know how many millions of Ukrainian refugees, uh, and I think the OEC human trafficking uh, representative together with his team has, has done a lot of good work in all of the concerned countries, in Poland and other transit countries, with creating up local uh, organizations to basically work with the OEC on, on countering the danger of, of human trafficking. And the other one is climate, climate change, climate security, uh, um, which uh, of course is now part of uh, the Aki of the organization. And uh, I, I regret that this high level meeting in March has been postponed, uh, but I think it's, it's there, it will be there uh, in the future, particularly in Central Asia. Uh, and so I think there also uh, the uh, OEC has a lot of space actually, has space really to do, to do more work. And not to forget also that the ODIR is, is the uh, election uh, agency of, of the OEC and this continues to do that. Uh, I think the entire question of election integrity is a big topic now with hate speech, questions of uh, digital aspects of elections. Uh, and here I think it's it, ODIR and OEC is not contested uh, across, the, uh, across Europe, across the uh, OEC space when it comes to these activities and here I think we can still talk about courant normal, or certain perhaps success which we can look at. Yes, um, another one. I think you had one. One, two, three. Perfect. The lady over there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mylene Dalio. I'm a PhD student at the University of Vienna. And I have a couple of questions. I try to be short. So the first is I'd like to bring um, uh, a particular case when the, role, when the EU, uh, OSCE played a crucial role, if I may say, in a, a war zone. And I'm bringing here the case of Kosovo, um, remembering at the time that it was the uh, OSCE ambassador who made a public statement about the genocide that was happening in Kosovo, and only after that uh, statement, the international community started to, to uh, move and uh, to be get, get more engaged in the case of Kosovo, and we know what happened afterwards, that the NATO got engaged, and somehow the conflict uh, 
ended, not somehow the conflict ended after the um, NATO involvement. Uh, it may be difficult maybe to make an analogy with the uh, current war in Ukraine, but my question would be, could it be possible if the U OSCE would be more engaged even in the, in the case of war in Ukraine and make, make it more vocal what is happening there uh, in terms of uh, security aspect? This is one question. The second one is uh, Professor Harry mentioned at the very beginning that uh, the, um, the situation in the Cold War was maybe better than it is today. So it got worse in terms of communication and everything. My question would be not very much maybe related to the politics, but to the environment in general. Uh, could it be that uh, the, the digitalization that allowed the uh, followed with censorship and <coughs> propaganda pl uh, played some role in worsening the, the situation in terms of making some dictators more stronger than they were in, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Yes. yes uh, may I, uh... No, we need it for the recording. Can you hear me? For yeah. the recording, we need it, yeah. Yeah, okay, if uh, you allow me uh, uh, a bit comment and uh, also acting as uh, a devil's advocate. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, underline what uh, Ambassador uh, Tanner said about uh, binary system and also uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hoffman said uh, about black and white. Yes, I believe that uh, OEC, it is not the fault of the OEC, this actual situation. The big crisis is also, as Ambassador uh, Strahl uh, underlined, uh, also the United Nations Security Council. So it is due to the global situation when we have uh, a movement from uh, the uh, unipolarity to bipolarity. I wouldn't say multipolarity, but bipolarity, which is in the making. So this uh, has reflected it has uh, made a big uh, impact on the OEC activities. We have the bipolar, uh, bipolar situation. We have a new Cold War, actually, but it is even worse than during the Cold War because we have in parallel also a, a warm war, so to say, a real war in, in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, this is the situation of uh, the crisis. Now, when it comes to all these uh, uh, discussions about excluding Russia, I think this is a way to nowhere because uh, the whole meaning of the OEC was exactly ga uh, gapping the bridge between the two, between the West and the East. So if you advocate for, uh, you know, uh, suspending or excluding Russia, it is uh, uh, a way to, uh, a road to nowhere. So what uh, the OEC should do, I believe, uh, uh, very briefly, I understand that uh, the OEC, um, uh, yeah, should now uh, somehow uh, restore the balance because it, it's been, you know, uh, the balance of the OEC itself was upset in favor of the Western countries, of the Western bloc, so to say. So OEC should start, uh, try to restore the balance and try to overcome this hatred toward Russia by the Western countries in order to restore a genuine dialogue. When I say hatred, uh, let me substantiate. And this will be a question uh, to Ambassador Tanner and to Dr. Hoffman. Ambassador T uh, Tanner mentioned Estonia's chairmanship. Okay, that's fine. But a few days ago, the Minister of uh, Defense of Estonia made a public statement saying there are, that Russia should be dismantled. So if you are putting, what would you think about that? This is my question to you, Ambassador. And also the Helsinki Commission or Committee under the, Sen uh, under the U uh, United Nations, uh, United States, sorry, Congress. Do you know they, ha they have uh, organized a number of conferences with the map of dismantled Russia and, uh, you know, appealing to dismantle Russia to destroy the country, which is a clear appeal against the territorial sovereignty of one member state. So what is uh, your response to that? Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yes, the last one, yeah. Nina Tannenwald, I'm the Fulbright Visiting Professor at the Diplomatic Academy across the street. And back on the theme of 
whether the OSCE should take on a new structure in the future. And I, I'd like to ask you to use the case to reflect on a, a more general question about the role of consensus decision making in international organizations. It seems to me we're at a point where consensus decision making is increasingly dysfunctional um, in maybe in the OSCE, in the Conference on Disarmament, obviously the veto in the Security Council and other organizations. Um, and so that states are moving out, in, in the, the NPT, states are moving outside of these organizations because the consensus decision making is effectively stalemating them. And so one can understand the reasons for having consensus decision making, but would you reflect on ways to um, curtail it possibly? I mean, would you make an argument why it's important in the OSCE? Can you envision? getting rid of it or, or some middle point where you can start chipping away a little bit at it in various in ways. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who, who would like to start? Maybe this time, Fred? Okay. Yeah. I think um, Professor Nina Tanabam. first, I think it's, it's a very appropriate question and I think um, one which perhaps has not been given sufficient attention also by the academic community to find a uh, innovative solutions to actually what we refer to now as the consensus trap, which really is at the core of the paralysis. And um, I think that um, the special thing with regard to the OEC is that cooperative security needs to be worked out among non-like-minded states. And I think that's the strength of the organization too. I mean, if you have an agreement, it's among non-like-minded states and not it's not again it's not the European Union it's not the G7 but it's really because you have to live with your neighbors you cannot choose them and so I think I think that's um, that actually has been a, an interesting report by the Wilson Center on this on this topic I think about a year ago about how to cooperate among non-like-minded states and uh, I think that um, there is the Moscow mechanism, which requires only 10 states to sign up, and then it can launch a fact-finding mission um, either into the host country, which agrees, or not. You can still do it, even if the host country, like in Belarus, would not agree. You can still do the, the mission, but you have to do it primarily then remote or through NGO contacts, etc. I think that's, that's, in my view, deserves to look more in this direction. Any other type of... Again, Moscow mechanism, of course, is, uh, is something, if, if you use it too much, you erode, again, this kind of community of non-like-minded states, which, I mean, the, the key word is, of course, compromise. You have to prepare, you have to work on compromises. But if there's zero space for compromise, of course, then, and the things are really dramatic, if there are atrocities or, or massive abuse, then I think you need mechanisms which we would, we would uh, have to do more in this, in this area. I think that was, I think, to your, your question. I have a couple of other replies. Yeah, there was still on Kosovo a question on digitalization and propaganda. Yes, Kosovo, I think you referred to also to 1999, I guess. And um, the fact indeed was uh, that uh, the mission was headed by an American. And of course, then he uh, has been uh, adopting an American policy. I think there was, yeah, of course, US has been very much present in trying to, I think it was, it was Mr. Holbrook, I guess, uh, Hol Holbrook, together actually with Mr. Milosevic, trying to work out uh, agreements. And, and so I think at a certain stage, it just turned out that head of missions of, an o of the OEC should not be states which are involved more from a geostrategic perspective. I think there has been a completely, I, th I think a different case with regard to the SMM where you had actually a, a, a top Turkish uh, diplomat, Ambassador Abakan, who was also before State Secretary at the head of mission, and he had a lot of gravitas, but was uh, basically, let's say, not, not politically from a country which would divisive or not accept it by one of the sides, but was also a country which had gravitas too. So I think that was the ideal, in my view, the ideal situation for choosing really head of missions uh, to make sure that uh, the mission is being uh, status neutral in, in its activities with regard to the task it has. 
And then I think there was one more question. About Stephanie. restoring the balance. Um, um, that it, oh, yes. Yeah. Estonia. Estonia. I'm sorry, I can't read my handwriting. So, <laughs> uh, I have seen, seen that too. And I think um, it, of course, shows the kind of uh, more absolutist approach now you have by what I refer to as front states, which uh, there's no space at all for diplomacy right now. Uh, and um, I don't know how long this can uh, go on. Again, I think there needs to be um, a, a group of friends uh, of, of some, I think there should be the US and perhaps Germany and a couple of other states knocking at the door in Tallinn and say, I'm sorry, you know, you re at that stage, please give space to Austria. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure this is my, my reflection here. You, you, sorry, you, Kazakhstan's possible, uh, yes. Yep. Kazakhstan was what a candidate. Well, I think it would have been an interesting solution, but I think it's much better to have the host country now stepping in. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I know it is a budgetary issue. There is a personnel issue, a personnel issue too. Uh, but I think uh, it really saves the organization in many respects. Terry, your final words for tonight. Okay. In this format. <laughs> um, but let me also deal with the, with the consensus question in part again, and, and, and the whole difficulty, of course, that international institutions have of acting on, on the really critical issues when, when the rubber hits the road, if you like, when things really get difficult uh, and you need to make difficult decisions. Um, institutions based on consensus have a hard time uh, doing anything. Uh, and, and the consensus principle, of course, has been part of CSC OSC from the very beginning, um, or, or really was, was, was strengthened, of course, when it became institutionalized at the end of the Cold War, when relations were sufficiently cooperative that people did not think at that point that consensus was going to create the kinds of problems that it has subsequently uh, as we have returned to a much more uh, tense uh, situation. Um, it is important to recognize also, though, I think that, I mean, consensus is also, in some sense, a safety valve for the institution. Uh, that is, uh, if, as it is for the UN Security Council. Um, you know, if you've got one country that is losing all the time and walks away, but whose participation is important, um, you know, that, 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 it, that it can block decisions that uh, affect its vital interests is frustrating at times makes us all uh, angry at times that we can't do something now. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if you didn't have the consensus principle, then you might actually be losing key participating states or members. Um, and therefore, the organization could not do what it does most effectively, which is still to try to bridge some of these gaps. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with Fred. I think we could find some ways if we reinvent this institution where we can have different categories of decisions, perhaps, uh, not all of which are based on absolute consensus, some of which may be based on a two-thirds or three-quarters majority or, or some other voting mechanism like that. Um, I, you know, I think all of those things need to be discussed because absolute consensus on everything, including uh, the budget, uh, the chairpersonship, uh, the secretary general, the head of the conflict prevention center, oh dear, uh, high commissioner, when, when all of those things are based on consensus, then of course uh, it makes it very, very difficult for the institution to operate effectively. Uh, so I think we need to come up with some, with, with some balance there uh, in order to create uh, a more effective working relationship. But, but on the other hand, you know, we have to be sensitive to the fact that it is important to keep countries, even when we don't like what they're doing, as many of us don't like what Russia is doing today in Ukraine, uh, nonetheless engaged. Um, and again, I mean, that was what we could do during the Cold War. Uh, I mean, I remember even, I, I went to, the International Political Science Association met in Moscow in 1979, and I went and did a paper on MBFR, actually. Um, and had a number of interesting discussions with uh, Soviet uh, uh, diplomats and negotiators who were working on M MBFR. The SALT Treaty was up for ratification. I got interviewed by Radio Moscow about the SALT Treaty, and I actually heard myself, and they didn't actually cut out anything I said. Um, and, um, you know, so, I mean, things like that were possible in those days. Um, 
And we had people like Anatoly Dobrynin uh, and others in Washington uh, who during the Cuban Missile Crisis and a number of other situations um, you know, had a direct private access to the seventh floor of the State Department um, where uh, he could go in all by himself quietly and meet with the Secretary of State and negotiate on key issues. Um, you know, so there were all of these kinds of mechanisms for consultation and dialogue that existed not always perfectly during the Cold War, um, but that have been largely closed off now. And that's, I think, why I find the situation so worrisome right now uh, is, is, is because uh, it is harder to even have these kinds of conversations. Uh, quickly on, on, on Kosovo, I mean, the, the Kosovo verification mission, uh, one, of, one of our students, and Nina Tannenwald and, and, and I are colleagues at the Watson Institute at Brown, uh, one, one, one of our students was, was Holbrook's assistant, uh, actually recruiting for the, the KVM. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, it was very heavily uh, recruited by Americans, for Americans, and the key decisions were being made by, by the United States. And, and, of course, it collapsed the minute uh, that, the, that, that it reported the, 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 the slaughter at Rachak, uh, and, 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 and then immediately, uh, you know, things went, went to a much higher, higher level, both politically and militarily. Uh, that, that uh, in the short run, at least, probably made the situation worse rather than better. Although, in the end, I think, I mean, I, the, the OSC, I, I visited the OSC mission with, with my students 10 years ago in, in, in Kosovo, and I thought that, yeah, we're actually doing a fantastic job, and I think there's a much more, you know, much improved situation in Kosovo, uh, in large part, uh, thanks to the role that the OSC is playing within the context of, un, within the larger context of UNMIC. Uh, and, and with the European Union uh, and, and other institutions. And, and, and the Kosovo case, I think, is a great illustration, again, of how different institutions can work together, dividing their uh, spheres of activity according to their particular specializations. Uh, but on the political side and democratization side and so forth, the OSC has always taken the lead in Kosovo. Uh, and I think it's been uh, an, an impressive uh, process that has, on balance, led to a peaceful outcome in one of the most difficult and, and, and violent uh, conflicts that uh, that Europe has experienced, at least prior to the uh, to the current conflict in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks especially to the two of you. It was very interesting for me. I hope for you too. I think we raised many questions, several answers, not the big answer about what will happen with the OSE. We will see. We will need to see. We cannot look into the future. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Heinz Gärtner, who actually initiated the discussion. So thanks, Heinz, for always uh, being supportive. He's also the chair of our advisory board. So thanks a lot. Uh, we will keep uh, looking at the OSE in the future. Um, if you're still want to be around and have a chat. We still have a little bit of drinks outside, so maybe we can discuss about even more what we could do with the OSCE. We couldn't tackle all the issues. We didn't talk about Armenia, Azerbaijan in the end, or even about uh, the role of China and OSCE, and also China in the sense of trying to be a mediator, maybe, or whatever that means in the conflict as well, since um, um, Xi Jinping called Zelensky, and we also know about this peace plan, so there are still so many things open and on the table. Um, thanks again. I hope to see you soon again. Now enjoy the evening and stay safe and be good. <laughs> Bye.